Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow Pikers, and welcome to the Pike Cast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and as always, I'm happy to be joined by my lovely co hosts. Hi, I'm Cassie. Hi, I'm Becca. Today, we're continuing sequel September and digging into Christopher Pike's 1994 novel, The Last Vampire 2, Black Blood. We are going to be breaking it down in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist, so consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the Pikecast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. This week, we welcome back to the Pikecast, one year later, co-host of the Horror Queers, podcast and hazel and katniss and harry and star podcast our first guest from our first book episode joe lipson welcome back joe hello i must say i'm following grady hendrix so this is like a lot of pressure for me <laughs> well i mean grady really lowered the bar for everybody by talking about um you know cake icing that you shove up someone's butt so really he just he leveled the playing field i think there we go there we go don't worry too much on on the plus side i'm bringing a much better book than remember me too (laughs) yes 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 you are uh i'm this is this is my second pike sequel i've ever read so I am also very happy to know that not all his sequels are soulless, terrible cash grabs <laughs> like the last one was. Yeah, you basically just need to keep him away from any kind of racial depictions, which we're <laughs> actually kind of okay with in this book. I um, mm-hmm. I re-listened to your first take on The Last Vampire with, I think your guest was Nan from the UK? Yeah, Nat, Nat. Yeah. Nat. And she was wonderful. She's a fantastic guest. And yeah, I will is. say that uh, I feel like at least we're also going to dodge the poop in the water issue that plagued that first book. <laughs> so we don't have guest questions for you because we already know your answers to the guest questions. And if you don't, listeners, you can go back and listen to, again, our first book episode, Die Softly, uh, which is 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 a joyous incel masterpiece mm-hmm. yeah i did uh, but- kind of bring an incel back this time though didn't i <laughs> yeah, yeah i was like there's a theme here with these yeah. mm-hmm. i'm sorry it's not me i swear <laughs> no it's not your fault it's just a coincidence <laughs> uh joe have you i mean do you have do you have any things you want to talk about about pike that have been going on in your head or in your life I don't know what I'm asking right now. (laughs) Uh, I will say that I was really interested. I've never made this connection before, but when I reread this book, it immediately struck me that Pike is doing preparatory work for the listeners, his, I think, second or third adult novel, because the detective character, like the FBI dude in this Mm -hmm. book, is identical to the protagonist and the listeners. Interesting. But does he also wear white pants and a sky blue blazer? <laughs> like any Most good likely. FBI agent. Like seriously, FBI. Those guys are usually in dark suits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is very like Dexter Miami Beach kind of yeah, vibes, exactly, right? But it's LA. I said we love a style icon, okay. <laughs> Okay, mm. yep, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I mean, he sounds hot, so I'm kind of here for it. Yes. Well, before we get into it, let's get to Magic Fire, and we'll start with the back of the book, which Cassie is going to give us today. Okay. 
Where had the new vampires come from? Elisa and her partner Ray thought that they were the last vampires. Suddenly, however, in one area of the United States, there is a series of brutal murders that can only be the work of other vampires. Who created these creatures? How can they be stopped? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that one's so short. Like, it's so, there's no information here. Really. I also like, like in one area of the United States. <laughs> we can't name it's it. It's almost as though there was no idea where it was going to be set. Are we still in Oregon? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Partially. We, we go back to Oregon. Oh my god. We do, yeah. There's a couple of flights or like a long drive or something, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, I'm just there's... happy we got to see Pat again. <laughs> oh god. Oh. What yeah. the fuck? I'm so, just like <laughs> Ray and Pat in this book, I'm like, get them out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I was I uh, you know, not to jump the gun, but I it, it's it's funny when you see a sequel that tries to to retcon the elements that he clearly doesn't want to continue with. Mm -hmm. And Ray is so obviously that. Yeah. But he still feels the need, yes, to bring Pat back, which doesn't make any fucking sense. Why Why Pat is back at all, it's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, yeah. yeah. So Seymour, I can understand Pat, I... I mean, I like Pat. I always wish that there was something more to her, but, like, did she need to be in this sequel? Absolutely right. not. Especially in the way she is in this sequel, which is, yeah, so, hi, I know your boyfriend that I stole from you is dead, and so you can be sad about that now. But also, he wasn't actually dead, but now he's really dead. But now he's really dead, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the artwork. Unfortunately, this is another one of those books that has the wacky cover where it's got the pike letters cut out and you can see a little bit of some artwork inside that really should have been on the front cover of the book because, come on, why are we hiding the art? Okay. I'm sorry, Huber, you... I love these cutouts. These are fantastic. Yes. No, okay. yeah. Thank this you. This is awesome. <laughs> Because I remember they were almost like a weird advent calendar where you were so excited, like, oh, I'm catching a glimpse of it, but I have to pick up the book. I have to manually open up the cover. And like, oh, what does the glossy reveal look like? Okay, Plus, maybe, it's good because if you're reading I'm... them and you don't want other people to know what kind of books they are, it's like, oh, this is just some pink reddish. Like, no, don't look at that. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. definitely okay. not a woman holding a black rose. No, no, and a creepy <laughs> hand thing. Yeah, with and and the coffin at the bottom. I mean, that's that's some fun artwork. It's definitely not Brian Kotsky, I don't think. Hmm. I, tried I don't Danilo. see a signature on it at all. No, it's Danilo Dukak. Dukak. Ah, okay. Dukak. I don't. I'm not sure, but it's not the latter him. day Pike artist. So, do we think these accurately capture what's inside? Uh <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that cover captures something. I don't think it's what actually happens in this book, though. I think a, I think a haunted, like an ice cream truck, would have been so much cooler. <laughs> that would have been super go, cool. Go like with the uh, the UK version of um, Slumber Party with the flaming snowman. That kind yes. of that kind of lurid cover. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I Cassie. think that would be that would have been great. I will say, I, I definitely hear the complaints. I don't think that the book covers have ever really been representative of what's on the inside. But I was reading the shitty, shitty three-in-one reprint, reprint Thirst, which <laughs> oh, looks like yeah. it basically just has oh. Rona Mitra on the cover. Yeah. And it is ugly as fuck. So I will take the old art, even if it is not the original artist, even if it's the weird cutout shit. Like, I will take it day one for sure now, now the thirst books those are those were released right around twilight right i believe so yeah it's when we were doing basically revisionist cover art for everything up to and including <laughs> things like jane austen novels yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> really i think it'd be great if you uh did revisionist cover art on all the classics but had brian kotsky do original Christopher Pike style work. Um, uh, that'd be fun. <laughs> so, yeah, the, I mean, this this description and this cover is very vague. Honestly, it could be 
any sequel to mm-hmm. Last Vampire. And what's really interesting to me is Last Vampire 1 came out in 1994. Last Vampire 2 came out in 1994. Mm-hmm. So this is clearly a sequel not a, that he wanted to write, a sequel that he was sort of planning for. I mean, this there wasn't enough turnaround time for them to say, hey, this is successful, turn around a sequel. Which I wonder if that's why we have this abbreviated description with a lack of clarity and detail as well as like a sort of generic cover because it was like, I'm writing the sequel now, but we need to have the art and the back in place and ready to go so that we can immediately print it. And it works for it because, I mean, if you like the first book, you really honestly don't care a whole lot what the plot is. You'll probably read the second one. Uh, and unlike in Remember Me, you won't be horrifyingly disappointed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh, uh, that's that's probably what happened there. So let's move on to Midnight Club and talk about our characters, starting with Elisa Pern slash Sita, who goes by both. So we can just call her either, I suppose. She's still a very cool character as Mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. I really like her and it's her character is enough to gloss over some of the more mediocre elements that I, uh, I have found in this. (laughs) How about you all? Yeah. She's still like a huge badass, like this opening scene where she gets reintroduced with her all black outfit and her gorgeous blonde hair and her big ass knife. You're just like, Oh yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I really like her. And, and the fact that it's a, a first person narrative, you still get the, the, the cocky sort of uh, pulpy detective type narration from her. Um, and that, that is enough to smooth this over. Yeah, this is, it's her, uh, confidence in what she's doing. And when she's not confident in what she's doing, you also get really good introspection from her. Um, and if only she wasn't moonly, you know, teenager in love with people it would it would be uh with everyone. ideal yeah with everyone every man she meets is like her soulmate again so elisa is not large she's only 98 pounds naked wait what <laughs> did this they is, say that yeah she yeah she says i am not large only 98 pounds naked i don't know if i just like skipped over that but well <laughs> That, that's a weird description. Her descriptions are all so strange. She talks like part of her thoughts and talking. She's like, yeah, I could not do this for my soul could not bear it. But then she's like, what are you looking at, punk? And I'm like, girl, mm-hmm. <laughs> what well, is she this? is 5000 years old. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's fair that she because she's lived through all of it, that she would have bits and, you know, back and forth. But it just sometimes it did kind of take me out of it with her character a little bit. And then I think I like her energy and her confidence. But also sometimes I was just like, who would ever think this? Like she's like, I was walking down the street. I love red and I love black. I know yeah, I'm right, right. gorgeous. And I'm well, like, here, okay, here, girl, like that. I wear black leather pants, a short sleeve black top that shows my sleek midsection. My black boots barely sound as I prowl the uneven sidewalks. I wear my hair pinned up beneath a black cap. I love the color black as much as I love the color red. I know <laughs> I look gorgeous. <laughs> and she mentions the black and red thing later on in the book too, just randomly. She's like, "I love black and red," or like, ha- "I like hats. I like them black and red," or something yeah, fucking yeah. weird like that. Like, it's just, I it's like all her. All foreshadow but for book strange. three, folks. Yeah, okay, are yeah, there yeah. a lot of black and red hats in that one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is black it is blood. Titled the black hat. So yeah. <laughs> black well, this blood, is black hats. blood, and yeah, then this is black got blood. red dice. Oh, oh yeah, red fair. dice. That's yeah. The, yeah okay. So funny. Which is so much better, let me add, than The Return as a single (laughs) uh, uh, subtitle there. 
Yeah. I mean, she, the return okay, is to be straight fair, to the point. It is, and she did return, just to yes. be totally fair to that title. I'm just saying. <laughs> there was it's no lies in Detective. <laughs> there was also no enthusiasm or effort, but yeah. uh, no, yeah. no, yeah, no I mean, lies, enthusiasm. Effort. It is what it is at face value. Just the return. <laughs> it's not like, a good one, but it's a return. There. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Ray Riley, a oh, character God, that I feel mustard. like <laughs> just like he's 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 like if Louis was obnoxious i mean a lot of people might think louis is obnoxious Who's what if, if if louis Wait, was louis? Uh, a, a oh, 10 from year old vampire? from from interview with the vampire oh. yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I was gonna say a lot of people do think he's obnoxious actually <laughs> yep <laughs> but, but what if what if no what if he's like a 12 year old that's that's right for me louis the 12 year old is ray just uh, he's so whiny. petulant. He yeah. is so yeah, angsty and just like, oh, we're not good people. Shut up! You have superpowers, yeah. dumbass. Like, what are you doing? So stupid. Which sucks because what I really like about the last vampire, the first book, is the unapolog- uh, unapologetic nature of vampire as monster. Like, mm-hmm. not once. Like, Elisa may regret some of the things she's done. But not once does she decide not to do them. You know, I'm not I'm not gonna be like this anymore. It's it's about this is my need, so I'm going to do it because like an animal, that's what I do. Uh, and and Ray is <laughs> exactly the opposite. And I thought they were completely fridging him when he sleeps throughout the first half of the book. Oh god, right? <laughs> And it's just like, okay, are we just never going to see him? Because that would be fine. Well, it makes me wonder if he's meant to be, like, representative of some kind of opposite. Like, we didn't get an alternative point of view to her in the first Mm. book. So this is like, well, what if somebody became a vampire and really didn't like it? Because you kind (laughs) of get that with Yaksha, but because he's your antagonist, you can't take that as seriously. Okay, that's true. That's true. I mean, I am not apologizing for this character because he is insufferable. Yeah, he he actually sits on his ex-lover, which is a great way of describing Pat McQueen, on her porch. Uh, just just sitting there, just feeling it. I, I, like a creeper. It, it is, totally creeper. Now, this is six weeks after the events of book one. So there's a very quick turnaround. Um, I think I think it's interesting because I think there are a lot of people who are very empathetic and very, you know, like they can't imagine like stepping on an ant or something. And so like I think it, it like you all are saying, it's interesting to have that kind of like juxtaposition to who she is. But it just it falls so flat because it takes away like I like watching her be a cool badass that doesn't care right. as long as she's like doing she's not like out there hurting people. She's not causing harm, but like if somebody needs to die so that she can save humanity, like they're going to die. That's it. Like, right. And then he's just like, Oh, let's be sad about it. Like, no, what are you (laughs) doing? Like he was just, he brought it all down. He's just, I couldn't even, and she's like, Oh, I was looking at him. He's so beautiful. I love him. I'm just like, if that were me, I would be standing there thinking like, I fucking wish I hadn't turned this asshole into a vampire. Like this is terrible. He should have just died. I regret my choice. (laughs) Yes. So filled with regret. Well, and really, like, there's one incident in this entire book where Ray gets to do something kind of meaningful. And I'm not talking about his death, because I think that that's just, like, bullshit martyrdom stuff. Mm -hmm. But when she takes him to the beach to feed, and then she inadvertently kills that girl, and you're like, okay, yes, that's her fault, but it's mostly his fault, because if he had it just fucking drunk, it would have been fine. And you're like, like, it baffles the mind how useless he is, and it's really frustrating because a lot of the other parts of this book could be really compelling, but then every time he shows up, it it's like Pike is going, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like a little brother, like, having to tag along with the older siblings yes. to get into adventures. Like, I don't want this. Who is this for? Well, and uh, he, is, he is sort of representative of the least likable qualities in Pike's writing here, because he is the representation of this desperate teenage love 
that this 5,000 year old vampire has, which doesn't feel real to me at all. Like her desperation to love him feels like someone who's 14 and just met the first person they're ever been interested in and is just so desperate. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, I, I hate him and I'm so glad he's dead and I don't have to spend whatever eight or nine books, I don't know how many there are in this series, listening to her mooning over Ray. I think, so, because when she talks about her old boyfriend, though, I think Ray's different. Like, she is, I agree with you that she is being, like, very, like, ridiculous over him, but I think that's supposed to lend itself to the fact that he's, like, a reincarnation of sure. her old love. And because, like, when she talks about, in Scotland, her boyfriend, she's like, yeah, he bled to death, good old Harold. It was, I was sad about her for a while, but, like, oh, she Harold. wasn't, you know, yeah. like, she wasn't, like, devastated. Like, it wasn't, like, life, like, altering, whereas for this, she's like, my world, like, everything that I care about now is gone, like. So I feel right. like that part makes sense. And she doesn't feel that way about Joel either. She, you know, she likes him. She thinks he's cute. But it, so I, that part makes sense. But it's boring. <laughs> That's well, not why I want to watch a badass vampire girl. But again, the the reincarnation of an ancient love. That's a that's a great thing. Why is Ray so bad? <laughs> if he is the reincarnation of this ancient love, why not give him these moments where he's actually developing uh, this? anything any depth whatsoever and and make him into an interesting character so then when he dies we feel bad yeah i think you hit the nail on the no i was yeah the nail on the head there we go That's i it, always yeah. get that you was wrong um <laughs> so i definitely think you got that right when you were introducing this cooper because it's Oh man, it just, it's so <laughs> clear to me that Pike is not interested in exploring Ray. I think right. he's really interested in Alyssa and he wants to continue telling these stories. Like that's why there's six of these books because this yeah. character has a long history. There's many things that are worth exploring in her past, but it seems very obvious that like Ray is a one and done kind of character. He can right. he can provide enough fodder for one book, but then after that, it's like oh, I got nothing else. And unfortunately, this sets a dangerous precedent for this series, at least in the first half. Like, that's, don't get too attached to Joel. <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I'm 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 already irritated with her not to jump all the way to the end, but she specifically asked Joel. If he wants to be a vampire, he says no, and she makes him one. Yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah, just because she thinks he's cute. I mean, come on. When he's a nice person. It's like, this is not a, a book series or a world for nice people. There should be no, no nice people in these books. It, they should all be weird or wacky or powerful or different, like... You have Seymour. That is Seymour's function. Everybody mm -hmm. else should be super powered and amazing. Well, and, it's and, an and, interesting fashion sense, at least. Oh well, yeah, yeah. His uh, sea blue sports coat of expensive white slacks. <laughs> uh, he he is. Uh, so let's go to Special Agent Joel Drake. He's a young man. He has blonde hair, almost as light as her own, and blue eyes, although they are darker than Sita's. His face is tan. His features sharp and intelligent. And yes, sea blue sport coat and expensive white slacks. Special <laughs> Agent Joel Drake on I the case. I want to meet this man. Dressed to the nines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see it. I mean, let's let's just admit it. We would all be swiping right on Joel. Yes. yes. <laughs> he probably I has like a golden retriever. He probably walks on the beach every morning. Oh, as wait, is that I Master Murder? <laughs> As soon as I see that blue blazer, I'm like, heck yeah. Who's the FBI agent in um in Ma Mindhunter? Uh the the one who's also the king in Hamilton? Jonathan oh, wow. Groff. There you yes. go. I was so close. Yes. <laughs> Jonathan Groff is special agent Joel Drake. See, right there. There. But would watch, would watch. Jonathan Groff without any of the rougher edges that Mindhunter brings in. So like Jonathan Groff in like sitcom mode, yeah. I think is, uh, 
is this special agent here. Which is interesting because so much of Pike seems to come from Twin Peaks. So when he finally does give us an FBI agent, he is so not Dale Cooper. Mm -mm. Dale Cooper would never wear that. No, no. (laughs) I mean, Dale Cooper's doppelganger, Bob, might wear that. Oh, God. Let's move on to Seymour Dorston, returning from the first book. And not having a whole lot to do, let's be honest. No, no there wasn't enough Seymour, I think. No, I think I think if we got rid of Ray entirely, we could have given Seymour more to do. Hmm. But I assume, I'm just assuming, Seymour is going to become more important in this series. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you remember the whole thing? You've read the whole thing? I've only read up to the end of book three. Okay. 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 But okay. from what I've gathered, this is kind of his role. He's like a utility player who will give Sita the reassurance that she will always overcome evil. Gotcha. Okay. So he's, he's like Q. Mm-hmm. So she goes to see him. She gets her special emotional skills. Yeah. And then, okay. I mean, that's fine. I, I, I just, I really like Seymour. And I really liked him in the first book. And so seeing him reduced to just like a cameo it's it's disappointing well it's funny that you say that because when i read seymour he seems like a very archetypal character for pike and it's (laughs) it i see him as pike himself like this is pike in real life this is Mm -hmm. what he is like where you know he's the sort of nerdy best friend who's really good at doing research, who's the storyteller, and he will prop up the hero to do the right thing. I agree with you. But so often in Pike's work, that character is also skeezy and mm-hmm. and just uh, it makes you very uncomfortable. And Seymour doesn't. And that's what yeah. I like about him. There and, was in Midnight. Sorry. No, no sorry, go ahead. No, in Midnight Club, there was the one the one guy, too. He was kind of like that, right? Mm-hmm. I forgot his name. What was his the, name? The other guy who had AIDS. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, Spencer? Spencer was his name, I think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. That was, uh, that was also Club. definitely the one we felt was Pike uh, Pike's avatar mm-hmm. there. Yeah. But to, to see more, I, I like him. His scenes are fine. They He's fine. They leave you wanting more. Shall we talk about our villain, Eddie Fender? Oh, God. I love this as a villain. Like, I know he's bad and I hate him, but I love him as a villain. Like, it's so, he's so awful and gross. Like, he really is. His voice is a strange brew, crafty and eager, easy and sick. Eddie is a sorrier case. He was the nerd in high school, in the high school library at lunch, picking at his zits and fantasizing about rape every time a cheerleader walked by. Very evocative. Somehow, somehow mm-hmm. I missed that whole part. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh no. I am shocked. And oh. then his eyes are the scariest. The green centers look like cheap emeralds that have been dipped in sulfuric acid and left out to dry in a radioactive dust storm. Is Who really but good? Pike could write a description like that? It's very season of passage, like what the yeah. vampires yeah. look like after they've been turned. Yeah, for sure. I I think he's a fun villain. Oh, yeah. He's disgusting and terrible, but he makes mm. a very, like, he's so hissable that you, you feel very compelled by him. Like, you want mm-hmm. to see Sita best him. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, when you find out what he's done to the big bad from book one, Yaksha, that he's he's taken him, sewn him into a canvas sack, sewn to his skin, and penetrated him with with large metal rods so he can't heal. I mean, that's that's dark shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we also talk about his um, idea of a romantic night? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Popsicles. Yes. popsicles. Let's, wow. let's talk about his night with popsicles. Jeez. That was insane. Also, I, I still I, don't get it. Like, I, she was forced to suck on popsicles, and if she stopped, he would tickle her. <laughs> like, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's the what weirdest. It's the weirdest <laughs> awful thing ever. 
It is. That uh, sounds truly like hell. Like I hate right. being tickled and I don't want to suck on a popsicle for six hours. Like no. she says it felt like she had like been overloaded on Novocaine, like her mouth and throat and oh everything. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's it's really strange and really dark. It <laughs> is. It's so <laughs> fucked up. Like this is these things happening in this book. This bad guy is one of the most like serious. I'm surprised this is one of the YA books that he's done and not one of the adult ones. Like yeah, just the the darkness in this character and his mother too. But like we'll get into that later. But just like I, it's mm -hmm. gross. Like an awful. I oh, I didn't remember yeah, that. This is very like. Something. This is very like back of the magazine fetishy, right? Yes. Like it almost yes. feels like I I read a wanted ad like sex work you wanted must be able to suck on a popsicle for six hours <laughs> and very much so. She wanted a second date too. Yeah, yeah. What what was that? I mean. I, they don't even quite. They don't even elaborate or they don't explain it. It's just like, yeah, I had to tell her no. Like, why did she want a second date? What was her reasoning there? Maybe, maybe she wanted different. Maybe she's been craving those popsicles. Oh my God. God, I can't. And because he was an ice cream man, he had those special popsicles that you can't buy at the store. Mm. I, is that a thing? I don't know. Oh sure. Can you imagine? Yeah. I always just assume you can't just get the ice cream man stuff at the grocery store because why would you go to the ice cream man then? Right, you got to pay those premium bubbles. prices. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, they are pricey. Get that thing with the with the uh, gumball nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, he 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 drinks his mom's blood uh, at, at with her consent. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's some incest overtones going on yeah. here. Yeah, it's, it's not under; it's over. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's something, and we'll, we'll talk more about him in the uh, um, Eternal Enemy section. But uh, let's move on to his mother now. Well, she's a real piece of work. Gross. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is great. This woman is mentally unstable. She has secret perversions. My mm -hmm. eyes do not cause her to flinch. She is fond of young women. I know. Little girls, even. I wonder about Mr. Fender. I add, may I come in? Yeah, and then here's where we, we enjoy being bitten. Uh, even I, an immoral beast, have never been drawn to incestuous relationships. Of course, in the literal sense of the word, we are not talking about incest. Sure. <laughs> Mrs. Fender is interesting to me because I've noticed this recurring theme of emotionally uh, damaged mothers who sit on the couch or sit on the chair and watch TV all day. This has come up in a few different books, and Mrs. Fender seems like the apex of that Pike archetype. Because yeah. not only is she damaged she's enjoying the damage. Yeah, there's a, a bit of a weird, um, almost like a judgmental tone that comes from Pike around like single mothers or like mm -hmm. people who don't work and they raise children. And it's, in hindsight, it doesn't look great, but I think at the time it was very much like, well, this is how we produce monsters is with right. bad parenting. Yeah, and that is a common trope, especially in the early 90s when they're talking about where serial killers come from, um, close relationship with the mother. That's always been a thing, mm -hmm. um, and especially when you remove the father from the, the, the environment and make them preternaturally close. I, yeah, I, I totally see that. Well, and don't forget, we were really entering the age of divorce after the 80s, where it was yeah, like, focus true. on the family, the nuclear family. And then in the 90s, it's like, oh, people are getting divorced. And we're really worried about what the offspring of single parents are going to be like without that either maternal or paternal influence. And here it's like, oh, well, she she mothered him too much. And look at what he becomes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's move on to Yaksha, who returns from the last book uh, with, uh, let's see, when the bomb went off, I was blown out of the house and into the woods in two pieces. Landing, I felt myself burning, and I thought, surely I will die now. I, but I slipped into a mysterious void. I felt as if I drifted forever 
on a black lagoon, the next ice age could have arrived. I felt bitter cold, like an iceberg drifting without purpose in a subterranean space. And that bitter cold was, of course, an ice cream truck. <laughs> uh, Yaksha's never hurt for, like, a good soliloquy, right? <laughs> exactly. It, he's a really interesting character, and I, I like that he's very self-aware in this book. Like, he knows where he's at emotionally. He knows where he's at physically, and he... He's just like, okay, here's here's what you need to do to bring down the big bad and then kill me, please, because this is this is shitty right here. I do like that her date with Yaksha on the edge of the of the water on the beach there. You're like, mm -hmm. they have more chemistry than she has with Ray. Yeah. <laughs> very much so. Because I mean, she is kind of a monster, a monster that we like. She needs someone who's also kind of a monster that we like. And yeah. Ray is not that. And no. Eddie Fender is not that. Uh, He's so, very yeah. much like the antithesis. Like, Ed yeah. Eddie is what Yaksha would have become had he been evil. Mm -hmm. So this is very much a, oh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And Yaksha's yeah. like, no, I'm actually really zen. Just, you know. <laughs> Throw me into yeah. the water after you're done with me. <laughs> and and what's great is like he he's aware that basically as he was waking back up, he was just babbling his full history. Like he was he was playing interview with the vampire the home game here with Eddie Vedder. <laughs> Fender. Fender. Eddie Fender. <laughs> not Eddie Fetter. Very different book. Yeah. <laughs> uh it, it's it's uh I mean, I'm I'm kind of sad to see him go. I wonder if he'll be back. Hmm. I can't recall, so I can't give you any any okay, help there. Okay, I didn't. I couldn't tell if that mm, was. A, I don't want. I can't tell you what happened. I mean, but, the thing is, is all of these books go back to different interactions in the past, right? Like right. It's one yeah. of the things that we've all appreciated the most about this particular story. You've got five thousand years of stories that you could be exploring. Uh, so it's entirely possible that we'll see some dream sequences or some flashbacks, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting even in this book. And I'm sorry, I know we're still talking about no, cast of characters, but it's surprising to me how small scale the storytelling stays. Like yeah. this is potentially the end of the world, but it's also like 10 people in Los Angeles. Right. It's, and that allows for focus but it also, it, it's the, the thing I'm seeing more and more in Pike's YA books is that his ideas are too big for 200 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's and, why he starts to move into adult fiction. Yeah, more. but even, you know, even then he just keeps, like, like these stories he tells in the past... I don't know. I, I feel like I could go both ways on it because I read the vampire Lestat and when he's wandering around with the wolves in the, in the uh, forest for like something like 250 pages, it felt like, <laughs> Oh God, I, I noped out. <laughs> yeah. So while I want more from these past stories, while I want them to be less, you know, beat by beat narrations and more actual chapters mm -hmm. i wonder if given more it would be too much and then i would be upset with it <laughs> it's tricky too right because so much of what's compelling about the stories that we are getting is the idea of what does a modern day vampire look like and how do they right. survive in the world right this entire book is really about oh we can't let vampires exist in the modern world because they will just kill everyone yeah Okay, we're going to move on to Pike's token. I'm going to shit on this character for no reason. Sally Dietrich. <laughs> About 30, she is a National Enquirer and, two, and a two-liter bottle of Diet Pepsi sitting on her desk beside a computer screen that keeps flashing temporary malfunction. Her lips swim in red paint. Her hair stands up like an antique wig. 20 pounds overweight. She looks jovial. 
a little slutty. Okay, how is she not our favorite character in this book? Her only function is to tell the story of someone else who went mm-hmm. on a date with Eddie Fender. Yes, but she's amazing. <laughs> The a little slutty part, which is really, it, it's not even, <laughs> there's not even an and. Just a comma, <laughs> a little slutty. Mm-hmm. Just like a random description. Just, yeah. you know, you all know what that means. <laughs> when you think it's of a so little bit slutty, <laughs> this is her. I'm like, I wish she had been the one who went on the date with Eddie. It would have almost made more sense, wouldn't it? More sense and been more interesting when she tells the story. But I feel like she has too much of a head on her shoulders to have ever fallen for this bullshit. She may be a little slutty, but she is not going to suck on popsicles in a wardrobe for six hours. Mm, Not frozen ones, no. (laughs) Oh, my. All right. Shall we move on to Remember Me, our plot discussion? Okay, so this book picks up six weeks after the explosive finale of book one, and it it gets right into it Mm -hmm. with uh, Elisa stalking the scent of vampires in L.A. And uh, right at the beginning, I was a little worried that we were going to go into the, um, the same sort of... L.A. inner city gangbanger culture that we had for Remember Me Too. Mm-hmm. Because when she meets the, these these gang members, um, let's see, are you saying you're dangerous, Elisa? He asks. You look like a party babe to me. Me and my God. stooges. Me and my stooges. <laughs> We're going to a party right now. That's you what I call it's going to be hot. I don't think that was ever slang. You know, my stooges. I don't buy that. I think Pike may be misunderstood. I don't know. But that, that yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. But then we get to this. Are you going to rape me, Paul? It's up to you, honeysuckle. He draws his piece from his coat. A Smith & Wesson forty five revolver that he probably got for his last birthday. He presses the muzzle beneath my chin, and it's up to Colleen. You call your gun Colleen? He nods seriously. She's a lady. Never lets me down. Yeah. Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle. <laughs> Let's Honeysuckle. just sit with that for a minute. Honeysuckle. Yeah. <laughs> it's just and Colleen. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. But thankfully, that is our only our only experience with gangbanger vampires. Well, I definitely uh, get the impression that Eddie is a bit of a racist and that he's turning black men because he yes. thinks that they're going to be more athletic and that they're more adept at like a kind of life of deviancy. So I, I was kind of happy that we just get rid of the extra vampires. Like we don't really interact with anybody in any right. meaningful way, except Eddie. Because we do have this other vampire that she's chasing, uh, who's African American and mm-hmm. built with like, like his, uh, something like his muscles are like TVs or something like it was really <laughs> strange way to say he has giant muscles i just imagined a man with like tvs on both like biceps well yeah it's it's like it's like popeye you know when when he he flexes and there's the american flag on his he must eat a lot of spinach (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) but what i what i find very interesting is when uh when our special agent joel says you shouldn't get within 20 miles of this area at night Mm-hmm. Okay, so I looked this up. The L.A. Coliseum, a 20-mile circle around it, <laughs> is Los includes Angeles. <laughs> all of Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Burbank, Pasadena, Long Beach, almost Anaheim. So really, you shouldn't get within 20 miles of the entire south of California, pretty much. So Joel's so, basically saying, stay out of the O.C., bitch. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> it's it, it's interesting. Okay, so we've got we've got vampire gangbangers that we don't see much. Thankfully. Wait, I'm sorry. Um going back to what you just said. Yeah. Um, those guys were they vampires? The ones in the beginning? Not at the beginning, no. Oh, okay, okay. They're so just they regular were. people who want to rob and no. murder. Yeah, okay. those were just, I, like, low lights. I don't know why I thought they were vampires. No, it, those are just assholles that were trying to, like, <laughs> harass a woman on the street. Yeah. They're not, and then they get they're murdered not vampires, for it, they're just assholes. Yeah. But then they get <laughs> murdered for it. Yeah, they yeah. do. They do. Well, I don't think all of them do, right? Like, some of them ran away and then told the no, cops just, that... Just, yeah, just Paul. Just Paul, yeah. Which, to be fair, I think they all should have died, but that's just... Mm-hmm. <laughs> So this is, like you were saying, Joe, this is a very compact plot mm-hmm. in that it's, it's the, I mean, the main, the main thrust of this plot is they're vampires. They're in a warehouse. Let's go blow up the warehouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are really only two major, two major set pieces here in that we have the stuff at the Coliseum where the vampires are gathering I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what that's what Elisa is chasing at the beginning. And then we have the vampires are at this warehouse sleeping. And then you, so it's it's very economical story wise. Mm-hmm. I actually quite like this opening scene, if only because it not only sets the stage like this is a different kind of book we're dealing with far more mm-hmm. adept vampires. We're not, you know, doing subterfuge and uh, bathroom stalls with super strong handcuffs anymore. It's like we're out in the open, but I I like this idea of like vampires competing in Olympic Coliseum games. Like, <laughs> just yeah. give her a javelin. Let's see what she can do with it. Here it is. I launch my javelin toward the young man. Too late, he realizes my strength and agility. He tries to jump aside, but the tip catches him square in the chest, going through his ribcage and spine. I hear the blood explode in his ruptured heart. A death grunt escapes his lip as he topples the long, sharp object sticking through his body. Yeah, ladies, you you must have loved this because you loved all the gore in the first book, and I feel like yeah, this opening this, scene is a bit of a banger in terms of like, oh, we're Becca just here. killing shit, people. <laughs> <laughs> this book has some good parts for sure when it comes to the gore. It, it does. Loves that. Uh, we... <laughs> oh, and this <laughs> this is uh, this is Paul here. Go to hell, bitch. He says later. I reply. I wrap my hands around his neck, and before he can cry out, I twist his head all the way around, breaking every bone in his neck. Clean Ah. shit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to, uh, wait, what did we decide? Elisa, Elisa, Elisa. I'm an Elisa Elisa fan for sure. Yeah. She is, she is uber sugar sister. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She was probably like the first sugar sister we just don't know because we haven't had a yeah, well i mean yet. she is five thousand years old so yeah so definitely <laughs> she taught she walked so alexa could run there we go <laughs> oh i love it <laughs> just me coming in with the jokes and then stepping well, back well done well done help. becca <laughs> i don't always do cocaine but when i do it has to be black or red <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And we, I wish we get the another next book was red cocaine instead of red dice. <laughs> <laughs> red cocaine. Um, another little shout out for Becca here. But before I leave the arena, I check on the three vampires to make sure they are indeed dead. It is always possible, despite the severity of their wounds, that they could heal and rise again. To be doubly sure, I crack each of their skulls <laughs> with the heel of my right boot. The grotesque acts cause me no qualms of conscience. I am, after all, just protecting the officers who might find them. I have that line written down with a smiley face next to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Becca, I, I always know when when something is going to go right into your uh... wheelhouse. Yes, yeah. Loves it. It makes me so happy. Thank you for knowing me. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> I do uh, love I do. that the officers in question are basically 
I, either just super lazy or interested only in eating donuts. Eating donuts <laughs> and, and arresting a prostitute who oh, is gosh. not a prostitute. I mean, that it's <laughs> it's the most bizarre and laughable uh, cough sequence ever. There is an interesting little uh, side jaunt into the Season of Passage universe. Uh, here he, he looks up at the stars do you think there are vampires on other planets mm. i don't know maybe in some distant galaxy there might be a whole planet filled with vampires or maybe yeah. right next door on mars <gasps> what about pluto <laughs> though <laughs> well there might also be a whole planet versus vampires on but it's not a planet anymore right and yes live in the now Cedar would be so disappointed. Uh, I wanted so to go to a planet yeah. called Pluto, <laughs> not a moon called Let's Pluto. Let's go to Pluto. <laughs> Could I make a joke about when yes. she first interacts with uh, FBI agent Joel? So he's like, I'll drive you back to your car. And she's, you know, leading him astray randomly. But he says, <laughs> okay, well, give me your number because I may have extra questions. And did you folks take note of her burner phone number? It's three three zero five 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 four one four one. I was like, "Bitch, that is the fakest sounding number I have yeah. ever heard in my life." <laughs> you you could like, me to write that down for you. And he's like, "No, I'll remember it. It's easy." <laughs> like, yeah, no shit, because it's not a number that bears anything to do with real life. Like, <laughs> oh no, it just directly contacts back to my house in Oregon. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting because she tells him that, and then she tells him she's staying in L.A. So call mm-hmm. this number, which rings my house in Oregon, but I'm going to be in L.A. But then she goes to Oregon, so when he calls, he calls her in Oregon. Mm-hmm. It's it's a weird bit of convolution that I, I feel like uh, would have been omitted in another draft. Yeah. Yeah, like there, there's a couple of moments where you just think, why is she making this so needlessly complicated? <laughs> Even the idea that she has to lure him down to her so that she can get the information out of the like basic humdrum police officers. Like, bitch, yeah. no, just break in at night and find out the information yourself. You don't, you don't need a man. That's the biggest <laughs> problem with these books. You don't need these men. And she she falls in love so. Yeah, and here here this is uh, that when they're driving, I reach over and touch his leg. I have a very sensual touch when I wish <laughs> to flaunt it, and I must admit, I find myself attracted to Joel. Not that I love him Ugh. as I do Ray, Boo. but I wouldn't mind seducing him as long as Ray wouldn't know. Having had ten thousand lovers, wow. I don't share most mortals' illusions of the sacredness of fidelity. So while we have a great non-monogamy shout out there, Mm -hmm. it's not ethical non-monogamy because she doesn't want Ray to know. And she she finds herself attracted to Joel, but wants us to know it's not that she loves him. Like I can fuck someone without loving them, just to be clear. (laughs) it's not that i love him and she's constantly reminding us that she loves ray Mm -hmm. but i think she's reminding herself like oh this guy's such a debbie downer no but i love him right yeah okay i I love love him him. i love him Mm -hmm. i love him so i'm gonna i'm gonna still be with him because i love him he's not as interesting as a wall of paint drying no i love him i love him yeah yeah I do wish I would have made, or they, Christopher Pike would have made um, Elisa more, like, a sexual character, because, yes. yeah, she's a vampire. She banged, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> like, I just wish the romance would have been taken out, and I completely get that, like, she's going... <laughs> Cassie. I'm sorry. No, I was, cause it was uh, no. Just in my head, I just heard you say it. Less romance, more fucking, and just like <laughs> yes, I mean, I just lost my shit. Yeah, I agree saying. with you, though. I yes, mean, and I that is know. exactly what Becca likes in a book: lots yeah. of gore and some some downright fucking. 
Yeah. And we should have just gotten rid of Ray. Like, okay, Ray, you're sitting this adventure out because you're want wine back in Oregon. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to go to Los Ray. Angeles, fuck this FBI agent, and then seduce Acne Face. The yes. end. <laughs> like, we did not need no love. We did not need it. No. No, that's true. And I feel like the only reason that they reflect, like, she talks about love is because she thinks Ray is, like, her husband from a million, jillion years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many years it's actually been. 5,000? 5, 5,000, I think. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't even talk about her kids that much or anything. Like, why is she so obsessed with this dude? I right, know. It's just fucking right. Ew. Honestly. Or we need some kind of description like, oh, he has, hus- like, magical husband dick, and I can't <laughs> get off it. That would have, that would have been a good explanation for the whole. Yeah, thing. I would. I would. Honestly, their their sex did not sound that exciting no. in the first book, and as far as I can tell, they don't have sex in this book. Mm-mm. So therefore, I mean, he couldn't yeah. possibly have magical husband dick. No. Okay, so then can we at least give Remember Me credit for that? Because there was like an alien or something that exploded out. That's yeah. true. Right. That's true. So Remember Me Too had a far more interesting sex scene than the zero <laughs> sex scenes in this book. You're Just right. That, Just going for it. that is what I will give it. That is all I'll give it. Like it it's says something. Title. It says something that Sita has a better like. A. I mean, I think she has good chemistry with Joel, even though he is basically Ray version 2.0. Like, he's yeah. just as boring and uninteresting, but sure, whatever. He's what got a fashion a icon. better fashion sense, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, she has more sex with Eddie in this book than she yeah, does that's true. with her supposed that's true. reincarnated husband. True. Well, he's so sad. He's not in the mood. He's just so yeah, sad. Yeah, he's just sad. Would you want to fuck him? Oh, my God. Oh, some aliens coming out of him. <laughs> I mean, a better book. I feel like you're going to get that in like book four. Just you wait. Like, oh, there's going to be of... aliens in here somewhere. Well, I, mean, I guarantee it. I, I have no doubt because uh, Christopher Pike, what we've learned is the longer he writes, the weirder he gets. Mm-hmm. So therefore, uh, a, a book series with like seven books, it's going to get really fucking weird by the end. I mean, I can't wait for you folks to cover book three because it's like a fucking blood alchemy in Nevada. Like, hang on what? to your tits. It's going to go weird. I, I love it. I love it. I'm excited. Okay, so we have another uh, ridiculously high school moment here with Sita, uh, with Elisa, where... Um, Joel is talking about, I did as you requested. I told no one where I was going, but I'll have to call in sometime today. And if I tell them I'm in Oregon riding around with a cute blonde, it's not going to look good on my record. So you think I'm cute? I ask. Like, oh, fuck. Bitch, focus. We are facing the end of the world. Can you two stop flirting? I mean, (laughs) come on. But yeah, uh, Ray is here, here. I've got some examples of Ray's just bland sadness. Ray is stubborn. It will take you only a few moments to put them at ease and hypnotize them. Then they won't suffer. I stand up outside the car and scowl at him. You would rather I suffer? Ray wearily climbs out of his side of the car. No, Sita, I would prefer to fast. Ugh. Fuck you, Ray. This is where you just wish you would reach over and just break his neck. I know, right? down with it. Let's move on. But then uh, Elisa Elisa goes down to the beach and grabs their sleeping bags so hard they fly three feet up in the air. God, can you imagine the cinematic adaptation of this? These kids just like (laughs) go up out of frame. They're bouncing so high. (laughs) It would really, actually, this would make a very good ongoing TV series. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and I I feel like if these other ones are successful, this will would be uh, a sure, let's, let's option that for a long series. Hmm. Yeah, they would really have to think about this Ray problem, though. Like, I know that we're having a good laugh at his expense, <laughs> but, like, that is not a storyline that could continue indefinitely you would have to be like oh i love him and then maybe sacrifice him at the end of the first uh the first season and be like oh i'm so sad he's done let's move on to a hot fbi Uh, agent though though if he lasts an entire season i think that would be a mistake 
a mistake. <laughs> Have him die at the end of the first episode like Jesse on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, like, we think he's going to be an ongoing character, but no. No, he's not. Best way to do it. One thing I really do love about these books so far is that uh, Elisa has all these little asides um, about her history as a vampire. Uh, I once buried a mortician alive in France after World War II in his most expensive coffin. He made the mistake of saying all Americans were pigs, which annoyed me. He kicked like a pig as I shoveled the dirt on top of him. I enjoy a little mischief. Okay, but why is she also a proud American? She's no, not that's, American. That's, that's funny. Not even close to American. But then this one's my favorite, though. Once in the 17th century, off the coast of what is now Big Sur, I even killed a great white shark. But not for food. The thing tried to bite off my legs. Oh my God. I love it. Just imagining that scene from what is it like Zombie Two, where it's yeah, like yeah. the zombie, zombie versus the, the zombie, shark. <laughs> zombie versus shark. That's so good, and it was a real shark for fuck's sake. God. <laughs> oh, and and here, here, this is this is well, you know, uh, like Spike says, if the number of vampires who were actually at the crucifixion was true, um, it would have been like Woodstock. Mm-hmm. So this is where she meets Vlad the Impaler. I once met Vlad the Impaler, the real man Count Dracula was based on, in the 15th century in Transylvania during the war with the Ottoman Turks. Forget those stories about his mean-looking canines. Now there was a fellow who needed modern dentistry. His teeth were rotting out of his mouth, and he had the worst breath. He was no vampire. Just a Catholic zealot with a fetish for decapitation. He asked me out, though, for a ride in his carriage. I attract, yeah, I attract unusual men. I told him where to stuff it. I believe I invented the phrase. Oh my God, she's so full of herself. It's hysterical. And that's what I like. Like, she can back it up, too, but she is so full of herself. It's, it's so much fun. <laughs> Except when she does this kind of bullshit with Ray. Uh, you never told me when your birthday is. Do you know? Yes. It is the day I met you. I was reborn on that day. Ugh. Gross. I mean, for someone who believes in reincarnation, that feels exceedingly gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it. this book desperately wants to cover up the fact that not only has she gone against her promise to never make like another vampire but also uh (laughs) that like she has basically committed statutory rape and then (laughs) turned her her victim into like a vampire against his seeming will like it uh, it has not aged well in that regard (laughs) Uh, and here here's another uh so she's 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 trying to uh to get joel to do what she wants better to kiss him i think than kill him but then I think of Ray, whom I love. I mean, why is the book trying so desperately to assure us that she loves him? It's almost like Pike writing himself, like, no, yeah, okay, that's why we had to keep Ray around because yeah, she loves him. Because because love he's, him. Yeah. Or or it is Elisa herself trying desperately to back up the decision she made. Mm-hmm. to turn him into a vampire. Or, hear me out, maybe, <laughs> maybe Christopher Pike wants to keep reminding you so that when he kills him off later, you get sad. Right. That okay, that actually right. makes a lot of sense and it <laughs> is the most likely response. Uh, yeah, because I think we are supposed to feel sad for both of them when he decides to die by suicide like he's doing a heroic thing but you're meant to believe it really does hurt sita even though the book can't allow any time for her to grieve right right it it didn't necessarily work but he tried just by like stating that you should care (laughs) but he didn't really like make any actions to make you care if that makes sense oh yeah 
but i think it's also because this book has no time for really anything like i i no. don't know about you folks but i feel like the introduction like the first half of it is actually relatively well paced but by the time we do the warehouse explosion all the way through the end it's just like bam 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 like there's yeah. no time to breathe but not it's exciting but it also feels like uh was he writing to meet a deadline like did he have to get this book submitted to publish it in 94 because it feels so rushed yeah it really does and it it does it does feel like uh, someone who has to deliver a book under 200 wor- pages mm-hmm. oh yeah so like, especially this ending like it their final encounter it's good stuff but it's like you're meant to believe that Eddie is going to be this huge adversary and he is bested so quickly and easily. And then it's just like, Oh, and uh, also the book's over. Bye. (laughs) Yeah. By singing to him. I did kind of like that. It's not, I think as evocative as the first book with the story of the snakes, but Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. This felt like a gentle homage back or like a callback to the first book. It's it's interesting because it's one of those things, I think, that like a lot of Stephen King, um, it wouldn't translate well to film mm. because it's it's more of an abstract idea that on the page it's fine, but if you saw it, it would seem really silly. Uh, so I I was envisioning just because Candyman is kind of like fresh in my mind right now, but I was Mm -hmm. thinking it'd be interesting to do it either as like an animated sequence or a shadow puppetry, like the whole, what is it? Mahisha killer of God sequence. Like, yeah, that could be interesting to try to capture in a different way. I do like that. Yeah. Or, uh, or like, I know, I know Harry Potter has uh, gone down Mm -hmm. in favor because of certain asshole writers, but the deathly hollows sequence Right, the uh, animation, the puppetry thing—that was that was also an amazing way mm-hmm. to tell a backstory that wouldn't feel as silly because it embraces the theatricality and the weirdness of it. Yeah, exactly. And then you don't have to cast actors and potentially get it like really wrong or offensive as well. Like, yeah, ex- exactly. It it all gets into a very risky area. <laughs> With uh, with Krishna and Shiva and all that, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would hope that if they ever did adapt this, that they would just make her like not a blonde Caucasian girl, but like maybe make her Indian. Like, wouldn't that be fucking fascinating? Mm-hmm. I would vibe so hard with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to take a quick break, and we'll be back with more of the podcast. Friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling Osgood as Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery 
with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters, and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at Osgood is Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, JJ Ronvier. All right, we know it's been a while, listeners but we want to shout out to all of our wonderful patrons and tell you that we could not be doing this show without you. So take a deep breath with me. Thank you, Jennifer, Christopher, Jillian, Eleven, Magdalene, Sienna, Laura, Boots, Allison, Anastasia, Nicola, Norma, Rebecca, Katie, April, Jeanette, Jamie, Crystal, Katie, Jenny, Jasmine, Nicole, Kristen, Jack, and Libri. You are all awesome humans, and the Pikecast owes you a debt of gratitude. Welcome back to the Pikecast. Okay, so we have 21 vampires inside this um, warehouse. And <laughs> none of them will Ray, ever meet or get to see anything no, no, else. Th- we're, just, we're just assured that there are 21 vampires and two terrified Caucasian couples who are there for breakfast. <laughs> it sounds like the start of a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and. She and Ray are bringing two giant gas trucks to either side of the warehouse to uh, blow up the warehouse. Mm-hmm. I I was very, very, very uh, concerned when she said she would have to silently kill all the dogs because I am one of those people who could give a shit about the people you kill, uh, but you don't fucking kill dogs period yeah uh I, but these I think are you could vampire swap this... dogs right i do or think it's rabbit. a pretty cool image though like the idea that she's just like squeezing out these like silencer rifle yeah. shots uh, like I bang, bang, bang. yeah i mean they solved it because they're they're worse than rabid vampire dogs <laughs> but, mm-hmm. <laughs> but then there's this it could be worse it could be vampire fish Think of a school of those swimming the ocean. We'd never be able to find them all. Oh boy, that is a that first, feels like that's first both draft nonsense. Most, well, yeah, okay, that, but how terrifying is that? But it though? also feels like an amazing idea. Yeah, yeah, that's so horrifying. You just go for like a fun, like it's like Jaws, but vampire small fish <laughs> or yeah. like, piranha. It's like piranha. So it's yeah. like piranha. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that would have been better to our to our <laughs> listeners at home who haven't watched the piranha remake. Oh, it is so good. A fucking great time. I was so scared that you guys were going to be like, that was the worst movie. And I was going to oh, be like, no, excuse no. you? Know? I adore it's amazing. the Piranha remake. Yeah. I mean, Christopher I Lloyd so. is in it. I, f- fucking Richard Dreyfus plays Matt Hooper in the opening. Jerry O'Connell's dick gets bitten off. Come on. Yeah, yeah right, right. And you have a Busby Berkeley style underwater lesbian dance sequence it's amazing naked i love that movie so much it's okay, crazy it, but there's a lot going on and i feel like i need to watch it oh, oh no yeah. yes. if if you haven't seen oh my god the, it is it is i will let you uh postpone dr sleep because i'm sure <laughs> you haven't watched that yet in no, order no, to sorry. watch piranha this is a big it's deal so fucking good and it has no business being so fucking good <laughs> And so then this is this is where uh, she encounters these cops um, who say, leave immediately or we're hauling your tight ass in. Oh, God, My so tight good. ass? What about the rest of me? That sounds like a sexist statement if I ever heard one. As okay. if she would actually take offense to this. She'd be like, thank you for noticing my tight ass. Yeah. It is quite tight. <laughs> Look at how lovely it's clad in my black leather pants. But but then, again, 
Maybe we should haul her tight ass in on a charge of soliciting sexual favors for money. But Elisa has the best response. I haven't offered you any money. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. But these, these cops are like Mayberry's version of awful cops, I think. They're just so uh, generic cop cop, you know. Anyway. So, yeah, Ray dies in flames. Combustion is immediate. The gasoline at his feet ignite. The flames race up his soaked clothes. In an instant, my beautiful boy is transformed into a living... I know. A living (laughs) torch. For a moment, I see his eyes through the flames. And as the first book told us, he has enchanting brown eyes. Well, now they're white and they probably popped. Yeah. And we're happy he's dead. But I did like, I, I liked when she's, uh, when they're playing the the hostage game and she's like, okay, so I have a sniper rifle and I'm going to shoot you through Ray because he will start healing immediately, but the bullets probably will stick in you. So that was, that was fun. Oh, I like it. I, I liked it for two separate reasons. A, because it's a smart plan. She she has thought this through, but also mm-hmm. because it means that we get to see Ray get shot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any suffering for Ray is good for me. Yes. So Ray dies. Woo! Then we get uh, <laughs> we get we get Sita and Yaksha reunited. In, I think uh, this is sweet. It's so lovely. It is. And it's what what I really like about it is he was the big bad in the first book. Mm-hmm. And this moment here, there's none of that animosity. There's just they're they're who they've always been again. And Yaksha even gets a little creepy at the beginning. What flavor would you like, little girl? Oh God. Because <laughs> they're in an ice cream truck mm-hmm. and you know ice cream men saying little girl is probably one of the creepiest things ever yeah. i mm. don't know about you folks maybe it's just because i have like a one track mind where if i see something and it reminds me of something else i'm like yes connection i immediately was like oh my god dexter season one is like riffing Ooh. on this book because oh, yeah. the yeah, ice cream killer ice cream truck yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> yes. That was a nice little memory that you gave me. Thank you. I know, right? Remember Dexter season <laughs> one when it was like really, oh, really good. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm always intrigued where you can take characters who shouldn't be friends or who haven't been friends and then invert or swap out that relationship. And yeah. I mean, to bring it back to this book, that's one of the reasons why I really like this because we get a, a glimpse of a different side of their relationship that we didn't yeah. get to see as much of in the first book because he was coming to kill her. And, and he was very posturing because yeah. he was so powerful. Mm-hmm. And here we're given a version of him that is not only not powerful, but has been laid low by yeah. injury and by being bested by another, uh, at first human, you know, mm-hmm. Well, and I yeah, think there's it's... there's a, an interesting humility between the two of them, right? Because she never fully recovered. And you could make the argument yeah. that her wounds are actually not physical. They're like emotional. Like mm-hmm. that's why she always has the pain in her heart until she deals with Yaksha because she she hadn't processed what she had been through with him. And right. this moment is like, okay, I need to be the badass bitch that I know I am. I need to stop moping around. Ray, a.k.a. my dead weight, is now gone, and I'm saying goodbye to the person that I truly love, and he's, like, made peace with it. So, like, you you can see this as the moment where the third act or the climax can finally begin, because yeah. we've done away with the emotional shit. Let's get down to the fighting and the killing. <laughs> yeah, because it, it goes full throttle after this. And and yeah, that that stuff with him is really uh, sweet and emotional and a very, very interesting way to take a character mm-hmm. from one book and give us an entirely new perspective on him. Absolutely. But then we go into the eternal enemy and the finale here. And it has one of my favorite things 
ever. It's when uh, a big bad is making a threat and the hero just disregards Laughs. it and threatens <laughs> on, on their own. It's, it's like, I'm going to count to five. No, I'm going to count to five. Uh, Not but, if I count to five first. Yeah, but he says, let's cut to the chase. I want you to meet me at Santa Monica Pier in 30 minutes. If you're not there by then, I will begin to kill your friend. I will. Oh, he has he has a special agent. Mm-hmm. I will do so slowly just in case a flat tire has delayed your arrival. It's possible you may still be able to recognize him if you're less than 20 minutes late. My mother, of course, is to be left in her home unharmed. Do you understand these instructions? I snort. Oh, give me a break. I don't jump when you say jump. You have nothing with which to threaten me. Such a thing does not exist on this planet. You want to talk to me? You get here within 30 minutes. If not, I will hang your mother's head on the front door in place of a Christmas wreath. The red color will be in keeping with the holiday spirit. Do you understand my instructions, you foul mouth pervert? See, Cassie, this is exactly what you were talking about earlier, where, like, she starts off and she sounds like a 15-year-old girl who's like, "Mm, I'm not jumping when you tell me to jump. And then she's like, (laughs) you foul-mouthed pervert, how dare you defile the sacred name of blah, blah. And you're just like, oh, it is both ends. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I I absolutely love that. And when the confrontation is fun and weird and... I like that she uh, she sort of entices him, but then I I I don't know. I really love that they're they're in the freezer and she just kills him with an axe. Mm-hmm. So unceremonious. I, yeah, just lops his fucking head off. I I really like that. And what did you, know, you folks think of uh, the kind of second round standoff where like, okay, you've got Joel, I've got mom and like, they're both just bleeding more and more and more. And it's <laughs> yeah, like, right. he's got four pints of blood on the floor. I'm like, oh, he's dead then. He's not just slumped against you. <laughs> yeah. Four pints of blood on the floor. You don't, you don't do that. You, you, that's just not even a, yeah, it's, <laughs> but it's. I don't know. I kind of feel like they're just replaying the last standoff, mm-hmm. except now they each have people. Yeah, and and Sita's like, um, I care even less about this person. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've and known him for two is... days and gave him a fake number. Like I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting. So our our finale our finale is she asks him if he wants to be a vampire. He doesn't. Ugh. But she only knows she will miss him if he dies. But also, you think you're dying. What are yeah. you doing? <laughs> and then she's like, he can be the last vampire. Like, you doom him to this? What? Yeah, what, what, is, uh, what is that? He won't even I know want... what to do. He it's would just probably so like, go up in flames. Yeah. It's, I want it's... book three to be Joel hunting Alyssa. Alyssa. I mean, that's what they He's set mad. up here. He may even kill yeah. me. So, I mean, I don't... that be if I said don't do that and then she did it? Yeah, <laughs> I'd be mad too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that that makes sense that that would be book three. I don't think that will be book three. No, it is Joe not knows. book three. <laughs> okay, so, because so I feel like Pike, Pike uh, likes to leave himself breadcrumbs, but then reads it and like, what the fuck was I thinking? Yeah, it's like he he writes things on the nightstand in the middle of the night in the dark, and then he wakes up in the morning <laughs> yeah, and he's like, yeah. oh, well, that's already gone to print, but I don't like it anymore. I don't like that. I don't want that. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. All right, let's move into thirst, titillation, and sexuality in Pike's world. There is a a sad lack of titillation and sexuality in this book. Uh, unless yeah, you're really excited about gross. the popsicles. Uh, I mean, the popsicles are amusing. They are. I'm, I'm more interested to hear what Cassie and Becca have to say about her seduction of Eddie, because this is like the thing that I don't love in a lot mm. of Pike's writing is when women just use their sexuality in really gross ways. Yeah, and and it's it just feels very like this was written. And brought to you by a man. Yeah, yeah for definitely. sure. 
Yeah, I think it makes it's like consistent. I feel like her using that with because like in the first book, how she's like trying to flirt her way, and then they don't really buy that. So she's like, "Well, I have I've got my period. I gotta go to the bathroom." And like, mm-hmm. so like I feel like her trying the sexual thing, but ew, like I can't imagine with that guy. Like, well, <laughs> just to, to, to really, stomach it, having to fake that. Like, ugh. you'd yeah. have to really like popsicles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take a sweet tooth, really like the cold. That was another yeah. thing. She's like, oh, I love the cold. And then he's like, oh, I'm going to take this bitch to the fridge. Like, what? Yeah. How do you not know that's a it's trap, so dude? Well, yeah, and I, I don't understand how he's been keeping Yaksha in the freezer to keep him docile and doesn't understand that maybe I shouldn't go in the freezer. Yeah, I think the only way we can really explain it is that her spell, the whistling, is so yeah, powerful that he's almost rendered stupid, like he's thinking with little Eddie as opposed to big Eddie. Yeah, that's <laughs> with, yep. little Eddie. <laughs> it's a popsicle, right? Gross. <laughs> Okay, well, we we all agree that the the sexuality is kind of shitty in this book, but uh, Mm -hmm. let's move to Die Softly, where we talk about moralizing and problematic elements. I think we already hit them. Yeah, I mean, this this book is mostly fine. Like anything written in the 90s, it probably would not look this way if it was written nowadays. But uh, apart from a little bit with the... the... (laughs) What is it? The the goons? Yeah, no, uh, no, Stooges. 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 Okay. <laughs> I think apart from that, and uh, yeah, just and the, the weird insistence that all of L.A. is inner city, right? <laughs> I mean, I think he lived in L.A., so I don't understand that. Uh, I don't. I don't even want to go into that. No. <laughs> Then let's move into Season of Passage, where we talk about the best and work r- worst writing, as well as Pikeisms. I am thrilled that we have a return to McDonald's oh my God. in Sally Dietrich's story about Heather, who went on a date with Eddie. Mm-hmm. First, he took her to McDonald's for dinner. She told me he had three hamburgers, nothing else. No drink, no fries, no nothing. He ate the hamburgers plain. Meat That's how you know he's a serial killer. Yeah, that is a psychopath move right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so best and worst. Does anyone have any, uh, or should I dig in? I have an words. amusing line, but I don't know what to make of it. Well, that can go in the, the so it's best, worst, and then I always have this extra category called weird. So Okay, I'll save it for weird. Start then. off the weird category. No, no, okay. start it off. Yeah. Okay. So it's when she's describing the street that Eddie's house is on. So mm-hmm. the line is, up and down the block, cheap colored lights, like so many out-of-season Easter eggs that have been soaked in day-glow paint. Add false gaiety to a neighborhood that should have been on the late Soviet Union's first strike priority list. I'll tell you, Joe, I have that line right in front of me. (laughs) Okay, because I I was just like, that's a really evocative, very interesting, like I can picture this street immediately, but also the Soviet Union's first strike list? (laughs) Like what? It's it's well written, but I don't understand what he's saying. (laughs) No, like, I I guess it's just so bad that it should have been immediately destroyed. Well, I mean, it could be quintessential Americana would be among the things that the Soviet Union would want to destroy. Mm -hmm. So that could be what she's saying there. But yeah, it didn't make a lot of sense, but I love the line. Mm -hmm. And then I think my, my favorite line is when she's describing Eddie's mom and she says, she nods as if to herself, her arthritic neck creaking like a termite infested board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, I have two others in the weird category. I can spot a male virgin a mile away. They walk like they've been riding a horse too long. Which, wouldn't it be the opposite? <laughs> <laughs> and then this one it, isn't it lovely when two loonies get together 
as lovely as when two uglies get together, I say. Rude. Yeah. Maybe that should have been in, in problematic. That's just kind of a shitty line. Mm -hmm. It's like, nah, I don't like that. Okay, under my best, moving down filth-strewn alleys and streets where power is measured in drops of blood spilled by bullets sprayed from adolescent males who haven't learned to dry yet. Drive yet. <laughs> That's a pretty good line. It is love very his long descriptors, eh? Yeah, it is very cliche. Uh, inner city uh, near the housing projects, those archaic hotels of hostility, where the checkout fee is always higher than the price of admission. Yeah, and these are first page descriptions, so he is really setting a scene here. Yeah. There, there's a lot of that in the first couple of pages, like even her own descriptions of herself and reminding you of just how narcissistic and egocentric she is. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Pike, it, it makes you sad that the end of the book doesn't have the same kind of love of language because it's so front loaded in this yeah. book. When that again, I think I think a lot of Pike's uh, a lot of the criticisms of Pike's prose come down to speed and lack mm -hmm. of revisions. Yeah, and while it's also some of the source of the best of Pike because he doesn't have time to think about is this too weird? Yeah, sometimes it, you get gems yeah. and sometimes you yeah. don't. <laughs> sometimes you get Helter Skater taking a walk on a razor blade wall. God, and and it's it's clearly the most memorable thing for every bike reader ever. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you get, uh, oh yeah, and then this happened. Uh, so here uh, sounds like a piece of cake. This is uh, this is when they're talking about their plan. No, it's a baked Alaska. They'll burn. Oh boy, I, I, I assume we've moved into bad writing now. Oh, I love it. I oh, love no. the fake the last one. No, 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 no. I love it. Oh. Because it's it it's it's shitty, but it's also dialogue. So uh, I don't I don't know. I I feel like she's making fun of it too. I don't know. Maybe I just like her enough that I'm willing to forgive it. I like, just... Whatever trash she says, I fucking love it. <laughs> I just love the idea of her saying that line and Ray being like I don't know what a baked Alaska is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's just an idiot kid. What are the chances he's had baked Alaska? <laughs> yeah. I do have a bad line. It's kind of yeah. delightful, but also what, bad. What so do you got? It, I can't remember. It must have been, I think it's in the passage where she's talking about Harold and or something else from the past, but it's, there were, yeah. they were enough to make me dream of Hawaiian vacations even though Hawaii had yet to be discovered. Yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> that that made me cringe, yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you folks done Bury Me Deep? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so Pike clearly loves Hawaiian vacations, where right. anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Here's, here's one I really like. Beyond this, I sense the true significance of my body, the instrument through which this song of life and death is continually playing for all of us. The realization even gives me a sense of the player, my true self, the I that existed before I stepped on this wicked stage and donned the costume of the vampire. I like that a lot. I like the idea of her donning the costume of the vampire. Yeah. Which is weird because it, she's been one for 5,000 years. For five, so she, yeah. she feels like she's been wearing this fake persona for that long. And she, she's embraced it too. So I think that's why I like her so much and why I'll, I'll put up with her flurried exchanges mm -hmm. is because she's, she's playing a part that's part what she should be playing and part what she needs to be playing and then part what she wants to be playing. And I like that. Yeah. I have one more line, and I think you'll all like it. Eddie drops his gun and grabs me. We kiss. Hmm. Yuck. <laughs> and I believe, folks, that is the subtitle of tonight's episode. We kiss. Hmm. Hmm. Yuck. 
Yuck. It reminds me, there was another book that had a line very similar to that, and I loved it also, but that is just so... It tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, uh, it it and and it doesn't it doesn't embellish. It's just hmm, yuck. I love it. I love it. Well, let's move into last act where we give our final thoughts and our ratings out of five pikes. Joe, as our guest, you get to go first. Okay. What do you get? What do you got for it? So I will confess that I think. This is a good continuation of a story that I liked in its first iteration. Like I'm mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of this particular run of Pike stories. Like I don't love a lot of his other sequels in the same way, but this sure. feels like a natural addition. And I think some people will quibble to say, "Oh, well it feels like this is one book stretched out into six parts because they all have this kind of very fast-paced energy." But mm-hmm. I I don't know. In some ways, I think it embodies the best and the worst of Pike. And if you like him, then these are probably exciting stories with a good character. I really just do wish that we could drop these really shitty men because they just don't add anything to these books. And you start to see that they're almost disposable to the stories as you continue. So, um, yeah, I like it. I don't love it. It's not like in my top tier, but I really enjoyed rereading it. So I'm going to give it three and a half pikes and the half is going to be a popsicle. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Becca, how about you? Okay, so I'm going to go with Joe when it comes to I wish you have dropped the shitty men. Yes. Um, yeah, because I, I really do like Elisa. And I like the like action and the gore in this book. I'm going to give it 3.5 popsicles. They're all popsicles. Oh, they're all popsicles. <laughs> and the last one's kind of bitten off. Yeah. Yeah. Tastes like no Ooh, cane. Yuck. <laughs> 3.5 yakshas with popsicles. Wait, oh, okay. Because he's already like cut because off. Because he's, he's in like, half. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was a difficult one. I forgot right. to think about my rating while we were like talking, so that was like <laughs> last minute. No, it was it came together it was well. Good. Yeah, okay, I, I'm, awesome. I'm happy with it. Cassie, where are you at? Um, I think I like like Becca. I like the gore and I like the the speed. I like the villain as a bad guy. Um, but there was a lot in here that was a bit slow for me and that I felt like was super unnecessary like I think if that had been cut out I would have given this a much higher rating so as it stands I'm just going to go with I think three pikes with a small stack of red and black hats (laughs) (laughs) so is that small stack uh, a quarter a half? What? What? Or are we just three pikes in that a small stack? A quarter. Okay. A quarter. So, so overall three point two five, but the point two five are red and black hats specifically. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> okay. I am also going to go with three and a half, and since Becca took the top half of Yaksha, Ooh. I'm going to take his two legs that were uh, flown clear somewhere else, and that's my <laughs> half. Um, Cooper found him just for his rating. Yeah, I, I went into the woods and found them. <laughs> I, I I really like this. I there there were definite issues that I had with it, but it it makes me happy because I also really liked the first book. It makes me happy that this feels like a, a legitimate continuation that wasn't written as a cash grab. Mm. And and even even though I know uh, from from what I've heard that Remember Me wasn't a cash grab, it was a it was a cash grab for the publisher, but not for Pike. Pike right. was just kind of forced into it. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this series goes. And this book makes me want to read book three, which is the key with any series of books. If it makes you want to read the next one, mm-hmm. that's, that's a successful sequel, I think. So and I think, 3.5 is mine. Yeah. 
And I think you folks are actually going to enjoy book three more because it's got a lot of what works in this book, but it doesn't have Ray. So you, you have Joel and he's a more willing partner. So it doesn't feel like every time we have to go to him, he's dragging the story down. <laughs> good, 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 good. But seriously, if Joel dies and then she turns someone else at the end of the book, I will be irritated. Don't tell me if that happens. I will be irritated. I'm he's just letting lens. everybody know he's going to be mad. <laughs> I'm, I'm pre, uh, preemptively just saying that. Uh, so, so, Joe, where can our listeners find you online? Uh, and, oh, yeah, also, thank you so much for coming back. Oh, and, my and, pleasure. Uh, for being our first guest a year ago. I'm I'm proud of us for continuing this this long because mm-hmm. I know podcasts tend to end. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming back and tell us where our listeners can find you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah, it was always a delight. If uh, folks want to get a hold of me, the easiest way is probably on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. And my handle is at B Stole My Remote. That's the letter B. And then I do have a couple of podcasts, as you mentioned off the top. We've got Horror Queers every Wednesday and my YA adaptation podcasts, uh, Hazel and Katniss and Harry and Star, which is... Yes, it should be back by the time this comes out. Sorry. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, That comes out every Tuesday. Well, very cool. And I wanted to let you know that I I really enjoyed your analysis of uh, the original Candyman and the new Candyman on uh, Horror Queers. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Yeah. those were challenging and exciting and also just slightly daunting episodes to do. Oh, I'm yeah, absolutely. Uh, But I, I think it's uh, it's and and of course, the new Candyman movie is absolutely worth seeing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen to those horror queer episodes, horror queers episodes. Um, Becca, where can we find you online? Yes, I have a blog, which is as told by com. I have a TikTok and a Twitter, which is as told by Bex and an Instagram, which is read with Bex. And all of it is books, like book related. All, <laughs> so. all of it is books. books. Just books. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, how about you? I am on Twitter at Control Alt Cassie, C T R L A L T C A S S I E. And then you can also find my art and books and things like that at shopletsgetgalactic.com. And you can find me at Cooper S. Beckett all across the social media verse and CooperSBeckett.com. You can buy my books there. And if not, you'll send your goons after. Right? Yeah, my stooges. My stooges. stooges. My stooges. I think I just wanted it to be goons. Yeah. <laughs> Hired goons. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, where can they find our show online? You can find us at the Pikecast on all social media, and we're on Goodreads. There's a reading group, so you can read along with us. And then we also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Pikecast, and that helps support us and keep us going. You also get early access to all of our episodes and access to our special Discord channel. And I wanted to say a special thank you. Uh, we are getting a lot of people listening uh, to our show on YouTube. And they're commenting, and it's it's a lot of fun to see those notifications uh, from YouTube. I had no idea it would be as popular as it is, considering it's not videos. It's just <laughs> uh, audio. But thank you for listening there. Your homework, Pikers, for next time, the final sequel of Sequel September. Yes, that's right. Three episodes this month. That's a good deal. Is Chain Letter 2. The Ancient Evil. Whoop, there it is. So, (laughs) whoop, there it is indeed. I like it, but that one is mean. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and it's also also a distinctly supernatural version Mm -hmm. of a story that was not supernatural in its original incarnation. Yeah. He really, like, amps it up. So you folks are going to have fun with that. Well, thank you as always. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, ladies. And thank you, listeners. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Woo! I like the warble in that. Yeah, that was. (laughs) (laughs) I was like a little owlish with that. 
You survive the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams.